Welcome everybody, you come from all over Australia, from many communities, from children's sites, non-government organisations, government organisations, and as you can see from the logos up there, we're trying to mix you all together and develop a whole of community, whole of government, whole of family approach to what we're doing. Children today face um, many challenges. And if you look at the challenges up there, you'll find that they're far more complex than anything any of us have had to ever deal with. And most of those family problems that we have today that children face really stem from parents, from boomers, generation X, and generation Y parents, and some of the technology that we've created. Something to think about, as Suzanne said. In today's world, um, it takes a village to raise a child. What do we need? Do we need a cyber village? Do we need an urban village? Or should we all go back to the country? Let's go back to the country. That's where I was born. No, I wasn't born in an ancient campus. <laughs> it was a hospital in those days, but it's become an ancient care facility at local. This is where they uh, checked me out to see if all my faculties were working. Caps. And about six acronyms later, it's still caps. <laughs> this is the kindergarten where I learned to play. And um, when I went back to visit a little while ago, in the back corner there, um, there was this huge sand pit, I remember. And when I looked at it, I thought, gee, that's not very huge, is it? I, I love that sandpit. It was really something else. And also, I love to sit around with the uh, kindergarten teacher and, and sing songs around the piano. That was absolutely fantastic. This is the, um, the integrated church and school that I attended in local. This is the picture theatre. And I remember the um, first film that I ever saw, first one that Mum and Dad let me go and see, was The Ten Commandments. <laughs> <laughs> I think I went to sleep because it was a very long film. <laughs> and this is where Mum and Dad worked so that us kids could get an education. Spent most of their life working behind those walls so that we could get an education. Lobethal was nice, but um, it's a long way removed from the experience of many families today. And uh, if you've seen the film Snowtown, you probably know a little bit more about what some families are dealing with in the site at Salisbury where I work. Because that film probably really should have been called Salisbury, because that's where most of the things happened in, in what was called Snowtown. That was what it was like, that, that, that was actually set in the late um, uh, 1900s, um, sorry, not the late 1990s, that film was actually set. So that was what was happening in, in our area, in the north of Adelaide. <coughs> the Communities for Children has given us the opportunity to uh, deconstruct a lot of what's been happening with family support services and come up with some more functional alternatives. The closest initiative there would be to C for C in the world um, would be Shore Start in the UK. And we've learned a lot from Shore Start, and I think Communities for Children took a lot of its um, basic elements from Shore Start. And um, it's interesting some of the things that they've come up with. What Shore Start has told us about how to run early year services that impact on children's social and positive outcomes. The most salient factor in determining positive outcomes for children is the home learning environment. What parents do with children before they're old enough for school, and as they get older, what they do with them in the hours that they're not in school has much stronger effect on the child outcomes than group care. That's from a book called Naomi Ocean Stuff, which I've just been reading, um, which talks about the foundations of the short start in the early years and how it's developed. This graph shows the relative impacts of the different areas such as gender, um, low birth weight, duration in preschool, um, quality preschool, social class, and home environment. You can see home environment on the end uh, has the largest effect on the, just on even the development of literacy, and you would have thought that that was the domain of the schools, wouldn't you? But 
of the early years, what happens at home is, is really key to all that. So what was important to you as a child? We've had Carla and Nadia as a Pinkerton residence uh, in the last 12 months in South Australia, and she's been telling us a lot about the importance of early childhood in terms of the way the child perceives things. You might have read the book, A Hundred Languages of Children, and she talked about how we need to listen to children, learn to listen to children. One of the things we had with her was a conference, um, and we were asked before we went to the conference to think about the place that we cherished as a child. What was the place that we cherished as a child that really meant something significant to us? And we all had to think about that and come along to the conference and bring that with us. Well, for me, it was, it was Lobeth Hall again, and there's the house, and it was the sand pit. Um, right, um, right over here, under the car floor now, we used to play cricket there, it wasn't sealed in those days, and we had a little sand pit, and it was right near the back door where Mother would hover when I was about one or two years old. She'd hover around there, and I'd just love to go to that sand pit and play. As I got a bit older, it was this area just down between the house and the shed. There wasn't a gate there then, there was a gate out the front. Um, but there was a patch of dirt there, and Dad didn't use it for gardening, and nobody used it really for anything, so I uh, used it. As uh, Suzanne just said, the boys had found grease in the pond. I found great dirt. I loved to play on the dirt. I loved to build little communities in that dirt. I would use sticks and stones and all sorts of things to build little houses and roads and all sorts of things. And, and that was, uh, for me as a child, that was just so important to have that place to play where I felt safe and um, where I could do things with my hands and get dirty. So, you should try that exercise, the exercise of thinking about the place you cherished as a child. I believe every planner, everyone involved with planning anything involving children, should really be um, involved in doing that exercise at some stage because it's so really important to get the perspective of the child. What does it mean to build communities with children and families? One thing is it means is that we need to consult with children. We need to consult with parents, we need to consult with family support workers and services, but we also need to consult with children. We need to ask children what is important to them. When we started Communities for Children at Salisbury, one of the things we did was actually, we went to the primary schools and we got about 300 children to um, um, etch onto tiles um, what they saw as important, and we put these tiles in a playground. And um, if you look at that, it's, it's interesting too. You can see James is there. <laughs> he, he's like most of us, isn't he? He grew up thinking he was the only person in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but then we've got another one here, which is a little bit more sophisticated. So if there's one person, they're just part of the family. And that's, uh, that's really more realistic about the way it is. But that was a fascinating exercise. Um, so, uh, with Communities for Children, we um, had the opportunity to um, develop a series of urban villages, which is really what we did um, in Salisbury, where families could be linked to other families and community services. And we found that was a highly effective way of supporting vulnerable families. And then we started this with the concept of a Salvo's urban village. And this is not the best photo in the world, but that's our Salvo's urban village, which for three days a week is the main uh, sort of worship area, which is just used as a continuous playgroup. And uh, families love it. And uh, you should talk to Katrina, who's here on the desk, about that sometime. It's just a, a great concept. Second thing we did was uh, establish Families Zone at Eagle Farm Primary School. And um, it's, a, it's an urban village, too. And that's really what people said it was. It, it's, it's got a kitchen, it's got um, access to uh, information technology and so forth, internet. Refugees, people from all sorts of different backgrounds come in there and they find it a place where they can grow and develop and learn from each other and learn from the professionals that are in there as well. In South Australia we've got three Commonwealth funded communities for children and families, children and family centres, 34 state funded children centres for early childhood development and parenting and four jointly planned Aboriginal children and family centres. Nationally it's about 40 uh, federal including 35 Aboriginal and about 250 in states. The UK have 3,500 
It's easier for them because they don't have three levels of government and integrated silos, in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> Another thing we need to consider, and we start to look at this conference, is the cyber village. Where do the children fit in? What's going on in terms of social media connection that people have today? This is um, what my, my mummy blogger had to say. As generation wise, we are accused of being self centered, and it seems like when it comes to the choices that my generation seems to make for their kids, it appears those decisions are often rooted in self centeredness. If you're an educated professional Gen Y like myself and you have kids or think you want to have kids, ask yourself this simple question, am I doing what is best not only for me but for my child? And that's something that every parent and every generation has needed to think about. So why are we having another conference? I'd like to give you three reasons. One is the practitioner sandwich needs. Anybody know what that is? Research has set research and evaluation priorities. Policy makers set policy and performance indicators. The practitioners get chewed up in between if they don't dance very well. <laughs> this is a conference for practitioners as well as researchers and policy makers. But we really want to focus on practitioners. Practitioners learn from each other, build on previous experience, look for similarities in context, as Larry Green says in the paper in 2007. And generally, do not dismiss every learning prior to the introduction of the scientific method just because it is yet to be researched by random, nice, controlled trials. <laughs> Another reason. Have we got it yet? Do we really still understand what it means to invest in the early years in terms of brain development? Are we going to save ten times the amount of labor on in terms of what happens as children who are not supported in the early years grow up and uh, get involved in... in um, low attainment, um, require benefits, teen pregnancy, um, shorter lifespan, drink and alcohol issues, um, poor mental health, etc. Third reason, transdisciplinary and transagency work is not right. rocket science, it's hard. <laughs> As Naomi Eisen said, she was in Adelaide recently. <coughs> Integrating silos can be difficult. In the UK, they found in a study, and, and there's been a lot of evaluation in uh, Australia Community Children Project. In the UK, this has been a lot more extensive and it's covered a lot more details of specific areas. And some of the things they found is, are echoed by, the, by what's uh, happened in Australia. Um, but um, they found that it's important to build on the strengths of services already in place, which is what we found very much. Put in place strong governance, management, leadership systems, have a welcoming, informal, and professional ethos. Empower parents, children, and practitioners. And uh, later on this morning, Dan, Wal Dan Walker is going to be talking about really empowering parents and what that means and how you can do that through education. Um, order to respond to community needs. Identify children needing specialist services. Recruit and train staff with appropriate qualifications and personal attributes. And Commissioner uh, Robert Fitzgerald has done a lot of work in that area and he's going to be speaking to us in a minute. So we'll probably hear some more about that. And the other one is manage interagency teamwork. These are real issues that we want to deal with uh, in the next couple of days and hopefully learn to do it much better. So, what does it mean to build stronger communities with children and families? It's different to doing it for, it's doing with it. So they are co-producers of the market, what do you keep saying? Co-developers of the programs that we're doing. 